Welcome to our review on conduction and convection. First thing we're going to look at then is conduction. So what we have here is the process by which energy is transferred through a solid. So what we actually find then is if we think about particles in a solid, going back to our knowledge from hopefully year seven, then the particles are always vibrating. So what we've got in our solid is gently vibrating little particles. Now, if we heat up that solid, then the particles get hotter and that means that they've got more energy. So if we give them energy, then the kinetic energy increases and they vibrate more. So that means that they're going to then collide with the particles they're packed nice and closely next to. And in doing so, they transfer that kinetic energy from one particle to the next. So you can see in that diagram in the middle there, that if we heat one end, the particles on that far left hand side gain kinetic energy, vibrate more, they knock into the ones next to them, passing that kinetic, kinetic energy along, and this continues all the way along the material. If we think about a metal now, then metals are slightly different to other materials in the fact that they've got these things called free electrons. Now these free electrons will also gain kinetic energy when we heat up the metal itself, and those free electrons are capable of moving through the metal and that means the energy is transferred from one end to the other faster than if the free electrons weren't present. So this is why our metals are good conductors of heat because they've got free electrons that gain the kinetic energy and are able to move from one side of the metal to the other and transfer that kinetic energy quickly. If we consider reducing conduction then, first thing we need to understand is what makes a good thermal conductor. And the property we're really looking at there is the fact that they've got these particles that are arranged in a lovely regular pattern very close together. That means it's very easy for the vibrations to be passed from one particle to the next. If we consider a thermal insulator, these are the ones that don't conduct heat well. So what we find is that their particles are close together, but they're not in this regular arrangement. Therefore, it makes it harder to pass those vibrations from one particle to the next. So what we find is that while our solids tend to be quite good thermal conductors, our insulators or the poor thermal conductors tend to be liquids and gases. So that's because we don't have this regular arrangement in our liquids and in gases, as hopefully remember from the particle model, then the gas particles are far apart from each other. This means it's much harder for those particles to come into contact and therefore pass those vibrations from one to the next. So we can actually apply that knowledge in our homes if we want to reduce conduction by using those principles. So if you think about double glazing, which lots of us have in our houses these days, then what we've got there are two panes of glass and between them we've got this layer of gas. So what we're going to see there is obviously the heat is going to be able to travel by conduction through the pane of glass, but then it hits that layer of air. So at that point, because the air is not very good at conducting the heat, then what we're going to find is it reduces the energy loss through conduction. The second method of energy transfer is convection. So if we're thinking about what tends to use convection to transfer that thermal energy, then it tends to be fluid, so liquids and gases. So what we will find here is that when we're looking to see the method by which energy is transferred through a fluid, then we're going to be looking at convection. So in the picture at the bottom, I've given you an example of how this works in our houses. So we've got our radiator on the bottom left of the picture there. So what happens is obviously the radiator is going to be transferring thermal energy from inside to the surrounding air. Now, as that happens, then the air becomes less dense and therefore it rises because it's less dense than the surrounding air. So the warm air rises up and then as it travels along, it's going to transfer its energy to other particles and therefore cool down. So that means that as it gets cooler, it becomes more dense and therefore it starts to sink down towards the bottom of the room. So what we actually see is this ability to set up something called a convection current. So the warm air rises, it loses the energy to surrounding particles, becomes more dense and sinks and it will continue in that little pattern over and over again. So we'll see these convection currents being generated anywhere that we have our fluid being heated. So this can happen in anything you're cooking on a stove that's obviously liquid. It could happen in your own rooms in the house. 
so that as those particles gain energy, they're going to move faster, and that means that the air then expands. The density will decrease, and that means that they will then rise up. So what we then find is as they transfer that energy to other surrounding particles, then they become more dense and then sink back down. And this little pattern is going to be repeated over and over again. Now, if we think about how to reduce our convection, then we've got a couple of different methods by which we'll use this in our homes. First one is cavity wall insulation, and the second one is loft insulation. And the way that they both work is by preventing convection currents. If we prevent those convection currents, then we're going to reduce the amount of heat we lose from our homes via convection.